If you go looking for studies of 2001 A Space Odyssey, either through a search engine or here on YouTube or elsewhere, or even in academic papers, you tend to get stuff that is either by establishment film critics or movie professors in uh, colleges and universities, or you get the corporate funded movie trivia channels here on YouTube. But across the board there, you tend to get pretty much the same story everywhere you go. And that is that the monolith in the movie is basically an alien artifact which arrives on Earth and helps the apes to evolve and then it, it, it's placed on the moon, it's buried on the moon so that when man has evolved far enough to get to the moon and can dig up and find that monolith, then he's ready for the next step of evolution and blah 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 blah. That the whole movie is about aliens coming to Earth to help humans evolve. That's the story you get from almost all of the attempts to study this movie. And pretty much it comes from two sources. Uh, the first is interviews with Kubrick himself where he would outline the basic narrative that's pretty uh, obvious in the film. Um, and he did that um, in 1969 to an author called Joseph Gelmus, uh, sorry, a journalist called uh, Joseph Gelmus. And, you know, he outlined the basic plot of the movie there. Um, and then many, many years later, you know, in the last couple of years, um, an, an interview clip appeared on YouTube, which is, um, uh, I think it was a Japanese journalist who spoke to Kubrick over the phone and asked, what's 2001 A Space Odyssey all about? And Kubrick just gave the usual, oh, it's aliens helping man to evolve to the stars. Kubrick basically gave that spiel over the phone again. Um, <clears throat> but in the 1969 interview with Joseph Gelmus, Kubrick very interestingly made some statements that the alien narrative is only the surface level of the movie that there's a lot more to it. In fact, he described the alien plot as the film's, quote, simplest level. And he explained that the deeper meanings of the film, which would be highly subjective, uh, would be, I'm trying to remember the exact words here, he said something along the lines that it, was, it would have nothing to do with the bare plot of the movie. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what he said. I'll dig out the quote and I will put it in this video on screen later on. Okay, so you've got this surface narrative that was weaved. Oh, it's aliens helping humans to the stars. Um, and Kubrick would talk about that in interviews. And then you've got the novelization of 2001. And some people assume that the movie was based on the novel. It wasn't. There was an original short story by Arthur C. Clarke that was nothing like the movie at all. In fact, the monolith uh, was a completely different shape, and we'll get into that later. Um, but when the novelization was written, it was written as 2001 A Space Odyssey was being produced. The film was already in the shooting phase, um, and Arthur C. Clarke was writing that novel uh, as Kubrick was shooting the film. But, and this is where people get confused about the novel, Arthur C. Clarke did not have a free reign to just write whatever he wanted and just write whatever he believed the movie was all about into that novel. Kubrick had authorization rights over the novel. And this is thoroughly explained in the, um, the biographies about Kubrick that he had a, basically a stranglehold on Arthur C. Clarke. And if Kubrick wanted anything in the novel to be changed, scrapped, added, he could just go to Clark and say, look, I want this to be in there. I want you to scrap that and put this in there. Kubrick had the rights to do that as part of the, uh, the arrangement between him and Clark in the writing of the novelization. So as a result, the novelization is really, really interesting. Um, it's very different to the film in places, but it also includes some clues about what the monolith is. And they are extremely blatant clues. And we'll get into that later. Okay, so I figured it's about time for me to update my Meaning of the Monolith video because this isn't something brand new. I posted about this way back in 2007. I posted a huge article on 2001 A Space Odyssey and I, there was a chapter in there which I basically um, explained what the monolith is outside of the alien uh, plot narrative. Um, and I still stand by that, and I made a video on it, which has been one of my most popular videos over the years. Uh, but it's an old video now, and 
it's 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 not even shot in HD it looks really old now the video to look at so I thought I'd do this updated presentation and we are now in 2021 <laughs> and so all of the space race um, propaganda narrative stuff that we see in the movie it's not come to fruition where's the giant moon bases where are the man uh, the the manned spaceships traveling to Jupiter all that stuff has disappeared and so <laughs> it seems a bit funny that um, Kubrick would make a movie called 2001 a space odyssey and that mankind would reach that year and then look at the movie and go well hang on this space race stuff wasn't as easy as we thought <laughs> I almost suspect that Kubrick deliberately gave the film that name so that the film would have a reassessment when it came to the year 2001 so anyway we're in 2021 um, and I figure it's a good time to update my meaning of the monolith revealed video so let's do that okay so I'm now going to go into a scripted portion of this video where I present you with a ton of information that points directly in sensory terms to what the monolith actually is. And I am not at any point in this video going to say what the monolith is. I'm only going to show you the evidence that points to it. And if you can't figure it out from that, then there's not much I can do for you. But it should be so obvious that even like a, a six year old kid should be able to get it from the evidence that I'm going to present. All right, so here goes. Right, to get your head around the monolith, you need to think outside the box, or even better, think outside the rectangle. So let's begin our selection of clues with some information that falls outside the actual movie experience. In Arthur C. Clarke's original short story, the monolith was a pyramid shape, not a rectangular slab. Kubrick played around with different shapes during production, and after settling on the now familiar door-shaped slab, he experimented with filming the monolith displaying patterns, shapes and imagery that would teach the apes how to hunt. It would even display targets for them to throw rocks at. And none of this made it into the film, but much of it is retained in the novelization. Kubrick told Joseph Galmus that he didn't want to depict the monolith overtly as an advanced television teaching machine. So, the film intentionally withholds that information. The descriptions of milky mathematical patterns displayed to the apes, as described in the novelization, sound very similar to the patterns that we are shown during the Stargate and its aftermath in the finished movie. The Georgi Leggetti musical composition called Atmospheres is heard straight after Dave Bowman passes through the Stargate and begins seeing mysterious milky imagery. But that same musical piece was also heard in the intermission in the middle of the movie and before the opening titles at the start of the movie. In each of those latter instances, the music is heard over a plain black screen. There have been plenty of other films that play an overture before the title sequence. For example, the criminally underrated Star Trek The Motion Picture. But 2001 does something else a lot more unusual. After the final credits finish with the caption, The End the music carries on playing over a plain black screen for an additional three and a half minutes. I can't think of any other movie that does something like that. Another piece of Leggetti music called Requiem is heard in the first three appearances of the monolith. The apes, the moon, and floating around Jupiter. It's a very anxiety-inducing composition. However, in the fourth and final monolith appearance, the one to Dave Bowman, the music is absent, in fact, the soundtrack is completely silent, as far as I can tell at this point in the movie. And a couple of other things are happening here that are different and important. Bowman, now dressed in black and thus appearing to be like an ape, reaches across the dinner table and accidentally smashes a glass, which seems like a baffling detail that makes no sense at the alien plot level, but when he reaches across the table, he almost touches the edge of the s <laughs> Thus, he would break the visual code of what the monolith is. Straight after this, he changes from black ape robe to enlightened white robe. He then sees the monolith in a direct face-on position where we can clearly make out its significant dimensions. At no other point in the film were we able to figure out the dimensions because it was always seen partially covered at the base, so that we can't tell how deep into the surface it goes. 
or it was seen at awkward angles where an assessment of accurate dimensions was difficult. Bowman can now see the flat dimensions clear as day, and as he does so, the camera does something new that hasn't happened at all in the movie so far. It breaks the fourth wall. It cuts to outside the room, the room that Bowman appeared to be forever imprisoned in. At this point, the monolith becomes a doorway out of the room and out of the movie set, and the set itself peels away like a set of curtains to reveal a black... The notion of Bowman realising that he is in a movie is a bit bizarre, but it is openly hinted at in the novelisation. It states, quote, His feeling that he was inside the movie set was almost literally true, end quote. This gives him a godlike awareness of the film narrative in which he is playing the lead role. In the novelisation, there is actually a television above the bed, not a monolith, and it plays documentary footage about wildlife in Africa. Hey, isn't that what we were watching at the start of the movie? Before the Stargate, the monolith being freed from its rigid upright position for the first time in the movie floats about and occasionally threatens to align with the... Our views also gradually tilt during this sequence until we end up with a completely sideways shot which is locked in alignment with Jupiter and its moons along the equatorial region. Alignment is essential for understanding the monolith. And this shot is the only time we see the monolith perfectly on its side, even though it is tilting backward. Fully enough, the apes have a habit of looking sideways at things that they are trying to figure out. And we started the movie with a sideways aligned view along the equatorial axis of the moon, earth and sun. The monolith tilts back on its side and vanishes into the blackness of space. And then our view pans up 90 degrees, or sideways 90 degrees, being that we are already viewing things sideways, and that would place our viewpoint of the plain blackness of space as being in alignment with the monolith that we just saw tilt backwards. Then the baffling Stargate journey can begin. At this point, the conventional narrative of the film has collapsed, and there isn't a single line of dialogue beyond this. We're confused by an onslaught of rapid geometric patterns, but the most important pattern here is incredibly basic. We cut from a fixed vertical plane to a horizontal one. Another 90 degree perceptual shift. Only after this important perceptual shift can the tunnel end. The colour near enough drains entirely away, which in a cinema would leave us looking at a plain white canvas. At this point the music reaches its highest pitch, a moment of truth. In the excavation scene, the moment of monolith meaning revelation is literally the sound of audio feedback. This is the high pitch which occurs when a microphone and its own live speaker are placed too close to each other, creating a sound feedback loop. Pay attention as well here to the twisty movements of this guy's camera and the unbelievably subtle detail of a rectangular lens flare aligning with its own light source at the exact moment that the high-pitched realisation kicks in. And note the ratio of the lights in the panel, 4 by 3. Funnily enough, that's the exact same dimensions as a... Here Kubrick gives zero gravity toilet instructions written on an upright monolith. That's right, you can take the upright monolith aliens guiding man narrative and shove it or use it as toilet roll, whatever your preference. But the pilots of the vessel successfully make the connection. Here the landing base near the excavation rotates 90 degrees and the monolith rectangle flashes upon alignment. From this we cut directly to an ape descendant watching this lunar touchdown on a... So it seems that he also makes the connection between the flashing rectangle and the... 
In the ship that takes Floyd to the moon, a young captain who is a dead ringer for a young Stanley Kubrick has a giggle about the floating monolith dinner tray. Meanwhile, this hostess gets it too. Note the musical punctuation as she hits the 90 degree rotated position. As for Floyd and all his counterparts, look at all of the monolith shapes in this room, including the door. Now from all this sensory evidence, you must have made the connection by now. But stick around because it's fun and amusing to look at the many other clues that went over our heads for decades after the film's release. And also we have the narrative significance of this change in perception of the monolith. It's not just a little joke, it is actually important. Hal's eye is placed in a monolith, and look, it even sits on a mound like the other monoliths. This tunnel has a constantly rotating monolith, a small black one in the background. The production and marketing materials contain all kinds of extra clues, of which I'll give just two examples. The Polish poster puts the film title in a 90 degree rotated monolith, similar to a... And this picture from the Stanley Kubrick Archives book has Bowman's pillow, a rectangle, rotated 90 degrees to match the monolith. So simple. If you're still confused about what the monolith is, in which case you might need a surgical operation to remove the blindfolds, then consider this. The movie was shot in Super Panavision 70 format. Now you can just take this new meaning of the monolith and pass it off as a cosmic joke, it is funny because the monolith is the only thing in the movie that suggests alien intelligence taking part in the narrative. So once the monolith meaning is changed, the alien plot becomes a silly sideshow. But this is just the beginning. The transformation of the monolith's meaning, if you subscribe to it, makes it a gateway in and out of the movie plot. This opens the doors of perception regarding everything else, and there's tons of other stuff going on, other themes and concepts that are far more interesting than the alien plot cover story. As Kubrick said, quote, no matter how vast the darkness, we must supply our own light, end quote. And that's the opposite of saying that God or a parental alien intelligence is going to save us. But don't expect characters in the movie to explain these things for you in plain dialogue. They might hint at it with doublespeak dialogue from time to time, but don't expect any of it to be stated outright. And don't expect Kubrick to explain it in interviews, that would defeat the intellectual evolution point of the viewer figuring things out for themselves. Most of the evidence of what 2001 is communicating comes as direct, non-verbal sensory information that you have to stop and pay full attention to and consider in terms of its implications. Kubrick wanted us to earn our understanding of the film, not have it spoon-fed. If you're willing to discard of the wishful thinking, parental alien gods will save us narrative, if you subscribe to this new meaning of the monolith, if you share with others the urge to evolve, and if you put the observational effort in to unravel the movie's other layers, your reward is an expansion of consciousness. And if you really integrate the information into your perception of daily life, you can achieve a form of intellectual rebirth that will help you break free from what Kubrick in one interview called the verbal straitjacket. The tendency of people to prioritise words, especially words spoken by others, over their own direct sensory experience. But Kubrick also said that a lot of people resent having that verbal straitjacket loosened or taken off. And the reason for that, I think, is straightforward. Letting the words of others define your reality is the easy option in the short term because it requires no mental effort. Ironically, though, the people who cling onto that verbal straitjacket the more those people hear describing the monolith as a the more likely they are to take a sneak peek out from under the blindfold. And then they may even thank you for doing them a favour and tell somebody else about it too. So if you now share this reinterpretation of 2001, then there are various ways you can move forward in exploring this and other Kubrick movies. And yes, other Kubrick movies such as Full Metal Jacket, Clockwork Orange, The Shining those have great depth too. You don't have to do it alone either. Talk to others. Tell them about this new meaning of the monolith. Discuss the movie with them and explore the jigsaw puzzle together. Sit and watch the movie with your friends and study it with them. 
If you want me to give you some more clues, then you can watch these videos of mine here on YouTube. Take note of the ones that interest you, write down the titles, search them, find them, watch them. And I will be putting out more Kubrick stuff in the future, so subscribe or you might miss out. There's also a lengthy study of 2001 in article form on my website, which I will link in the video description below. But I recommend you try studying the movie for yourself first. Only visit my site if you want to dig really deep. If you study the movie on your own, then try to watch it in HD because some important details aren't visible on a standard low resolution DVD. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. If you haven't figured out what the monolith is from all that evidence I've just given you, then I really don't know what to do for you. Um, if people start jumping in the comments section on this video and announcing, oh, the monolith is this, I may have to delete those comments or completely switch off the comments section because what I don't want to happen with this video is for people not to figure it out for themselves and then just go, go to the comments section and see what other people say about it. Um, because it's amazing how many people in life have this thing where almost all of their beliefs are basically just plucked from what other people say. Oh, a newspaper said this, a friend said that. Um, and it's not very often that people actually form a direct observation of their own that isn't told to them by somebody else and where it's not all summarized in popular catchphrases. So that's why I've avoided stating outright verbally what the monolith is here. I want you to think beyond words and think about uh, paying attention to sensory evidence and then forming your own conclusions from sensory evidence, not from what you are told by other people. Okay, so I guess that's about it. I hope you've enjoyed this. Lots and lots of new material coming soon. Uh, like I said near the start of this video, there's a lot of corporate funded uh, YouTube uh, movie trivia channels I don't even think of them as film analysis channels uh, and they throw out a ton of content that's all like slickly edited and it's all arranged with like focus groups and uh, you know uh, groups of people who examine all the analytics and uh, try and get the most catchy thumbnail with a face like this <gasps> you know that kind of thing what you get here on this channel is serious film analysis genuine film study and the vast majority of what I post is original interpretations of movies, not rehashes of other people's material, which has become a very common thing with the corporate channels. So if you want more original analysis and not rehashes of what you can already read elsewhere, then do subscribe to this channel if you're not subscribed already. And check out my website, collativelearning.com, because there's lots and lots of articles on there, free articles and free video downloads, uh, stuff that's not available on YouTube because only about maybe 20-25% of my stuff is on YouTube. Go to the site, you can get tons of extra material there uh, and there's always new stuff being put up all the time and there's tons and tons of digital download stuff uh, which is paywall material but it's modestly priced and you can get a mountain of information from that on all kinds of movies including Kubrick's work and it helps fund my work because this is a non-corporate channel. Okay, folks, hope you enjoyed this. You've been listening to Rob Ager from one ape to another. Bye-bye.